This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Suzanne Roski. Suzanne is a leadership coach, taco and mezcal enthusiast, public speaker, and now an author. For 25 years, she was the picture of objective success, a partner at a global management consulting firm guiding Fortune 500 companies through business and team transformations. And then she embarked on her biggest transformation yet, her own. Roski stepped away from her corporate life and into an adult gap year in Mexico. And here today to talk about that, um, as well as many other things, is Suzanne Roski. Welcome uh, to Uncorking Story, Suzanne. It's super nice to be here. I'm really excited, Mike. Thanks for well, having me. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear. I, I can't wait to hear all about uh, this gap year. Um, but before we get to that, tell me, where does your story begin? So it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think my story begins with something I heard my grandfather say. And I, when I say heard him, I overheard him as a child, um, saying, this one's got her head screwed on right. She's going places. And I think that for me, that was just like, uh-oh, now there's the bell that I have to ring. Like, pop up Spike, put it out there, and I've gotta go get it. And I started working at my family's business when I was about eight years old. Um, I worked there every summer from the time I was eight until I was 21. And as I was getting into college and looking for something to do, my dad said, you know, a degree in poetry is fine, but it's probably not gonna pay the bills. Um, why don't you go into business? And I found accounting to be really easy. And I sort of jumped on this treadmill. And the treadmill was, you know, go through classes, get good grades, get an internship, get a job, work your way up through a company. And for me, that is how I saw success. And I jumped on that treadmill and I never really looked back, nor Mike did I look around. And it's really important because it really frames my gap here of being on, I call it the proverbial career corporate treadmill, moving ever faster until one day I woke up and I said, this is not working anymore. It's not working for me, it's not working for my family, um, but I had no idea what I was gonna do about it. And I think I started to hear that voice of, is this really it? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Probably seven, eight years ago, and I didn't do anything about it until COVID hit. Um, so that's the start of the story and where it begins. So <laughs> to, to well, get in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> no, but I, I want to stay in the Wayback Machine for a few minutes because um, I'm curious as to what your family business was um, and, you know, that apparently hired child labor um, because you mentioned <laughs> being eight years old at the time. So what, what was the family business all about? Um, so it is it is still in business. It is a hardware store at the beach. Um, I'm not sure that it was my grandfather's intent to have child labor, but it certainly was a way to promote responsibility. And his viewpoint was if you weren't in some sort of class, educational or otherwise, you should be at the store doing something. So I think that my beginning um, tasks were straightening suntan lotion, um, folding beach towels, and bagging things, sitting next to Miss Phyllis and bagging customers' um, purchases. What um, what town was this in? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's and in like... fact, my parents still have the business. My brother runs it now, and my children are working there in the summers now. So we're down to like the fourth generation going through the store. They're a little that's... older than eight, though. <laughs> that's so cool. That's so cool. I, lo I love those stories about family business. I'm actually writing a book right now that, that includes um, 
kind of a, a closely held family business as mm. sort of the, the center, the focal point of it. But yeah. uh, this this conversation is not about me. Uh, <laughs> so tell me, you're you're on this career treadmill, right? So you're you're yep. not looking around. You never really looked back. COVID hits. And you, you kind of mentioned that there was a voice kind of going off inside your head that you weren't paying attention to. I'm curious, what was that voice telling you at the time? You know, so there were there were a few times that it reared up. Um, I loved the process of being and achieving things. I, I'm not going to discount this. This is my personality. I was made for gold stickers um, in school and at work. I was the person who has said, it's a donut eating contest and I'm going to go get all the donuts. And I love that. And I did really well where there was a structure um, and I could go after those particular donuts. When I was going up for partner back in 2014, I think that's probably one of the first times that the voice kind of came up and said, is this it? Like you are working really hard. I got some, I will say, Probably the worst advice I ever received was asking, how do I go about making partner? What do I need to do within this firm? And I got all the standards, have your revenue numbers, manage your team, keep your clients happy. But the biggest piece that kept coming back around and around again was don't mess it up. And so it put this enormous amount of pressure on because messing it up could be anything, right? And so I went through this process and one day in February, my kids were little, um, my husband was away. It was a Sunday night and I snapped I, and I don't know what, over what, like toys were a mess. Kids were hopped up on sugar from ice cream Sundays. Like who knows? Like, but they were three kids under seven being nuts. And I started screaming and I scared myself and I scared my kids and I pulled it together, exited the situation, and I went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I was a shell of myself. I didn't even recognize myself. I was gray. I was completely burnt out. And it was as if someone put a different voice and idea into my head. And I had this thought that said, I wonder what it would feel like to have a gun in my head. Mm. And I pushed that feeling down. Um, first, I was terrified by the notion of why did I think about having a gun in my mouth at that particular moment? Um, and I got help, but I didn't tell a soul other than my therapist. I didn't tell my husband. I didn't tell my friends. I didn't tell my coworkers because to me, that was the epitome of messing it up to say that I couldn't handle it and the stress was too much for me. And so I think that's when is this all there is, started to formulate in my head. But again, this was what I had worked for. This is what I was told I was supposed to be doing. I was hitting all the accolades. I was getting those dopamine hits from work of, you're doing a great job, here's a promotion, here's this new title. And so I kept pushing it down. When COVID hit and I looked around at my kids and you know everyone was struggling, and I was working 15, 16 hours a day, helping our clients survive through COVID, get money from the federal government. And I couldn't be with my children. And I watched my youngest, who was seven at the time, slide out of her desk chair on remote school and lay on the floor for an hour. And I couldn't get up to help her. I didn't talk to her until the end of the day. And I, I think at that point, I was like, there has got to be another way. Still didn't do anything until July of that summer. So July 14th, 2020, we received the email from our school district that the kids would not be going back to school. And that little voice that had been quiet for so long, and I'd heard her and just pushed her down, finally stood up and at the top of her lungs screamed to the point I could not ignore it you are not happy. You can do better. You must do better. I just didn't know what better was at that particular point in time. Um, yeah. it took me all of about two hours to come up with maybe stepping away and moving internationally would be the solution. And were you, um, were you, I, I imagine you were working remotely at this point as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. All of us. You know, yeah. A march of, you know, I think when I saw my daughter slide out of the, the chair, it was April in July, still all working remote. My husband has always worked remote. He was very comfortable with the transition. What he wasn't comfortable with was all of his new office mates. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there was this whole thing, like, would my kids survive? But also, were we going to survive? Like, was our marriage going to survive all of this togetherness? Because none of us were used to it. And I know that's a, a problem for almost everyone, but that was really something that was high on my list of like, we got we to gotta shake something up here. Yeah. So what did, um, well, first of all, let, let me just, let me just go back for a second here. You, you, you realized perhaps that you had enough donuts. Is that right? I had enough donuts. I had eaten enough donuts. I realized that the prize for winning was more donuts. Mm -hmm. The challenge, Mike, was I didn't know what I wanted to eat. I didn't even know what was on the menu other than donuts because I had mm. for so long had just looked forward at what was next. Yeah. And I mean, just to continue with the donut analogy metaphor, I always get those mixed up and it's funny because <laughs> I'm a writer, but um, it's too much, too many donuts leads to bad things, right? I mean, it leads to uh, negative health outcomes and, and that's kind of what's going on in your life. I mean, you're not, you're not in diabetic territory, I imagine, but um, your, your mental health is being challenged. Your family life is being mm -hmm. challenged. Um, and, and all these things are converging at a time when there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Yeah. Um, it's too close for comfort at home. You probably see in your own kids their socialization is, um, and their learning, um, certainly being, being challenged given what was happening. Um, so what did you do? So that day that I heard or we got the email and my voice screamed at me, um, we happened to be in North Carolina. We were... We had taken to getting little cabins in the mountains and kind of getting out of the, the Washington, D.C. metro area to give us a little space. And, and our kids were actually at camp. My husband was out mountain biking, and I took the dog for a walk because, I, as I said, I knew at that point I needed to, to do better, didn't know what better could be. And as I was walking through the hills of around Asheville, North Carolina, I thought to myself, and again, like somebody planted it, not my own conscious, saying, we've always wanted to move international. What if this was the year? What if we packed everybody up? The kids can Zoom remotely into school. Bill can work remotely. I can take some time off and figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. And I literally turned and I will call it fast walked. It wasn't really a run, but I really kind of hustled my way back to the cabin we had rented. And my husband walked in from his mountain bike ride. And I said to him, I have a crazy idea. What if we move to Mexico this year? And he paused and I'm sure it was all of like, you know, two seconds. But to me, it felt like time stopped because Somehow, in the time that I had thought about the idea of moving to Mexico to the time I presented my big idea to Bill, it really had become like not a choice, but a foregone conclusion. And I didn't know what was going to happen if he said no. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, in the time he just looked at me, um, he kind of looked down and I was like, forget it. This is crazy. I'm sorry. And he goes, no, it's crazy. You're crazy. And we're doing it. Now, keep in mind, our kids are not there. We have not discussed this with them. So we pick them up a couple weeks later from a camp that we miraculously found open and sit them down with Chick-fil-A in a field and say, hey, guys, we have news. We're going to move to Mexico for a year. And they were like, wait, what? <laughs> We just went to summer camp. Where did you decide to move to Mexico? This is crazy. Um, and that's how we kind of came to the decision that Mexico was going to be the place that we were going to go and try to figure out and make the most of the COVID situation. Yeah. Call it turning lemons into lemonades or limes into margaritas, if you will. <laughs> I find uh, personally through experience that Chick-fil-A softens the blow of just about anything you can you know, spring on your kids. 
Oh, heck yeah, especially if you throw a milkshake in there. Oof, then, then all of a sudden. <laughs> but, you know, you have to think, if you're padding it too much, right, if you're, if you're giving too many, uh, too many good things, yeah. um, you know, they, they, they might, their spidey senses might start to tingle after a while. So they, they, they might have a negative reaction to Chick-fil-A yeah. in the future. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Um, so tell me, how did, um, how did your work take this news? You know, it was funny because I called one person. I kind of had to test it. My husband said, you know, let's let's test this and see what happens when you say it out loud to someone. And it felt like the pressure just released off of me as soon as I said, I need to step away for a period of time. Um, most people were really supportive. Um, there was a lot of looking at what I was doing and people outwardly were saying, hey, could you come on this podcast? Could you come on the webcast? Could you talk about our flexibility policies? I sort of became a little bit of a poster child. On the down low, a lot of my partners were saying, you are so smart. This is so hard. I can't keep doing this. I wish I was as brave as you were to walk away and to take this time, but I can't because of X, Y, or Z. Now, I will tell you, Mike, I felt anything but brave at that point in time. I felt, I was terrified. I had no idea what moving to Mexico looked like. And there's a pro of being really naive because you don't think of all the things that could potentially go wrong. Um, but also, I didn't have a plan. I had no clue how I was going to figure out what I was supposed to be doing. And it was probably the first time in my life that I didn't have a plan. Mm-hmm. And but I, I think, would say, I, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I, mean, I think about, you know, your career in management consulting. It's all about making plans for clients and yeah. putting together strategic frameworks and, you know, all those other fancy words. Um, yep. Yet here you are not having done that. I had no idea. I mean, literally, we, it was a, as my husband likes to say, it was a 17-year idea that we orchestrated in, in about less than two months. Mm -hmm. Because from the time we decided to go until we stepped foot in Oaxaca, Mexico, it was about two months. Okay, where is Oaxaca, Mexico? So Oaxaca is pretty far south. It's one state north of the Guatemalan border. It is a state and a city. So we were in the city of Oaxaca de Juarez, which is the capital. Um, if you think about a two-hour flight, two-and-a-half-hour flight straight south of Houston, you will land in Oaxaca City. Okay. Um, tell me, what were some of those early days like living in this um, new city? Not far from Guatemala, it sounds like. <laughs> um, you know, some of the things on the early days were excitement. Um, some of it was a little bit of quarantine. We got there and we stayed in the house we had rented for, for, for 10 days. Um, I think that the funniest thing that I like to think about is we got, when we're talking about how did people react when we tell them, a lot of people said, you're nuts. You're going down to Mexico. You don't know anybody. You're going to get robbed. You're going to get killed. Then I further explained, we talked to a person that we took outside of Airbnb, we didn't have a contract for the house we rented. So we were just going there with like a stack of pesos, hoping upon hope that this was really gonna work out and be a legitimate place that we could stay. Um, and our landlord sent a van to the airport to pick us up. And my first thought was like, Ooh, okay, good to his word. This is all going to be fine. And then you start driving in Oaxaca and the roads are eh, bumpy, might be a good term, um, you know, bordering on shaken baby syndrome in some places, <laughs> if you're mm -hmm. going really fast between the speed bumps that they called topes and the potholes. It is dark, like no streetlights dark when you arrived. I was, my only idea about Oaxaca was from Google and all of the curated images of this colonial town with beautiful buildings and I saw none of that. I saw just, you know, there were street dogs and it it was dark. You just couldn't see a thing. We passed through the centro where we got a little bit of a glimpse of the beautiful buildings 
and then kept driving up a hill and it got dark again. And we took a turn into an alleyway. And Mike, my first thought was, oh my God, they were right. They're gonna kill us. Like this is where it ends. And I haven't even had a taco yet. <laughs> <laughs> and we come out of this alley and we take a couple more turns and there are three people standing in the street under a hakaranda tree waving to us and i just felt this sense of one relief but also real annoyance at myself that all of these thoughts and preconceptions about the dangers had driven me to assume the worst in people yeah um and we really had to trust in those first couple of days as we went to the store as we asked questions in really bad Spanish with heavy reliance on Google Translate, how to do things, how to get around. Um, you'd approach people that had machetes, they're, they're everywhere. And I was terrified at first. And then I came to realize, well, even the four-year-old at the end of the street has a machete. Um, it's like a pocket knife, <laughs> it's, a way, it's a way of doing things. So I think in those first couple of days, it was really this, integration of trying to get settled in yourself and experience what was going on and go, this is not, we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. <laughs> Oaxaca is very different, but it's a good different. Right. So th this is not adult spring break, right? This is no. not like you and your husband and maybe the kids going down to senior frogs for a couple of Coronas or, or Dos Equis. This is I mean, you are you are not in vacation land here. No, this is you know this is real. What I would say, real Mexico. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say real yeah. Mexico. I mean, if you think about Oaxaca, um, sixty-five percent of the population in Oaxaca, uh, as a state, lives below the world poverty line. So they live on less than five dollars a day. Poverty is just it's a way of life. It is all around and. Yeah, it wasn't, I mean, it's beautiful. Please do not get me wrong. And the people are lovely and wonderful and I loved every second of it, but it wasn't the Cancun or the Tulum or Cabo. Um, it wasn't the traditional destinations. And, and we really created a life there, which to me was the most important thing for us to be doing that. So what's the little voice inside your head saying to you um, while you're down there? Mm. Said many things to me. Um, first, it said, and it was the, the inner critic voice of, you need to figure this out, and how can't you figure it out? You were a successful executive at this management consulting firm. You can do this. And my husband looked at me and said, you've never done this before. Give yourself some grace. Try to just relax. And a friend of mine said to me one day as we were talking over Zoom, you know, it's like you're a pressure cooker. You've been released and removed from the heat, but there is no quick release valve for the steam. And I started to just say yes to things. I said yes to different activities. I said yes to hiking with different groups. I said yes to, I've got to go to a market and I've got to figure out how to do things. I was the external face for the entire family of calling to get the water delivered or the gas delivered or when our cistern ran out of water and we had no water in the house because the city turned it off. I had to figure out how to get the PIPA with 10,000 liters of water to the house. Um, and so the voice started to get a little bit more confident in my skills. It's, I started to slow down as I walked places and just really found out that being in the moment and having to pay attention was so very important, one, for me to understand and not to miss things that were not gonna get done. And then I went on a yoga retreat and it was seven hours away at the beach. I drove and I got there and they said, so today's gonna be a day of silence. And my first thought was, wait, what? That was not anywhere in, in the advertisement. I thought we were gonna do some yoga, maybe some meditation, but like 24 hours of complete silence. And in that time, I really started getting in touch with that voice. And once all of the cacophony of sounds and annoyances of all of my thoughts, I just got bored of them. 
went away, I heard myself say, I want to do design. And I didn't know what that meant, but it had been so directive. I kind of picked that up and I put it in my pocket and I started hearing the voice more and more often, not with a picture, but with little pieces of the puzzle. And eventually I was able to put those pieces together and say, what I really love doing is connecting with people, creating those connections, sparking creativity and facilitating experiences. And to me, that became the voice that started to get more confident and louder and comfortable with myself in a way that I hadn't been in a really long time. So tell me, um, I, I love that story, uh, especially the, the sign the retreat part, because I know that would be hard for me as somebody who asks people questions for a living. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it brought me right back to Eat, Pray, Love, um, where, yeah. uh, uh, who is it, Elizabeth, um, is, is, you know, goes to, was it India? Yes, yeah, um, India, Thailand, and Italy. Right, right. Not not necessarily in that order. Right, right. Um, but she, I mean, the first day, I think, when she gets to India, she has to be silent. I just remember it being such a struggle for her. But So hard. Um, but, but it gives you that chance to listen to what the universe is telling you. Mm -hmm. um, not not yeah. to get all, you know, touchy-feely here, but you know, that little voice inside your head, um, you know, is sort of, it's communicating something where it comes from. I don't know, but um, you mentioned like design is kind of what you're called to. What, what do you mean by that? In terms of, I mean, you're an accountant. What, right. What, what's right. this design stuff? <laughs> so, so okay, you you just articulated what went through my head when I heard I want to do design, and I had no idea. I I knew I didn't want to go back to school. I didn't want to be a graphic designer or have to go through all of that. But as I went through and I kept reading books, I kept listening to podcasts, I just kind of went from place to place. And I was listening to a podcast and there was a woman, her name is Maria Judice. She was the founder of Hot Studios that was acquired by Facebook. Um, she's now an adjunct professor out of Stanford. And she said, design is just making sense of people's lives for them. And I said, well, I do that all the time. Yeah. Maybe this design thing isn't so far off of what I want to do. And again, it was just a piece to the puzzle of how I wanted to put it together. And, you know, the universe thing to me is, and I'll go with the woo-woo um, <laughs> to call it that. I don't know if it is. I actually really believe that if you put things out to the universe, it will answer. And I started taking all of these classes. I was taking a class through Stanford in their design school. And one of the things I had to do was put together life odysseys of what would I do if my current management consultant track wasn't available to me. And I kind of knew if there were no constraints what I would do. What I didn't know is if management consulting went away, but I still had to have a job. And so I went to my kids one day and I just said, and my husband, and I said, hey, you guys know me. Here are some sticky notes. I love design thinking. I love ideation. So I had them put down all the things they thought I would be good at. And they came up with some really interesting things. But there was this common theme of you'd be really good at, at a, being a bartender or a therapist or a camp director. My youngest said I'd be a really good uh, butler. And I said, um, excuse me? She goes, wait a second, wait a second. Let me like, hear me out. You're really good at organizing things, and you're good at spending other people's money. I was like, okay, she's not that far off base here. <laughs> um, and so I, I didn't know what it was, but I put them all together. And as I was talking to other people, a bunch of people said to me, have you ever thought about executive coaching? And one day when like the fourth person said it to me, I looked up and I said, huh, camp director, therapist, really trying to make sense of the world for other people. I think this is what it is. But I, like my kids didn't have the words for it and I didn't even have the idea beforehand. Yeah. Um, so, so what did you do about that? Oh, well, you know, um, came back to the States and went back to our, the management consulting firm and a, about a year later, um, I left and I launched my own company. 
Wow. Now, did you make partner at the management yeah. consultant? Yeah, firm? I was a partner for, for almost eight years. Well, actually, over eight years. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're, um, you're leaving a lot, right? I mean, financially, you're leaving a lot. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I can imagine, um, you know, that you're, I'm sure at the time you were a highly compensated individual. Yeah. Um, and you're taking a risk because you're about to start, you know, your own thing. I mean, getting into executive coaching, um, I mean, let's face it, there's, there's a lot of people out there who call themselves, yep. you know, executive coaches. So it's somewhat of a crowded playing field. <laughs> But you're no stranger to risk. I mean, you took this big risk going mm-hmm. to Mexico without much of a plan, you know, kind of uprooting your life and your family's life. Um, but, of course, that pays off in spades because you're getting a lot of insight into what you should be doing for yourself. Mm-hmm. And now here you are, um, leaving the management consulting firm and hanging out your own shingle. Yep. Um, so tell me a little bit – tell us. I shouldn't say <laughs> just me, but tell us a little bit more – about that and what that was like and, and, and how you wound up building your practice. So it's really been an interesting journey, um, moving into that idea of being an entrepreneur and a sole proprietor from a global firm that had 250,000 people. Uh, it's quite a shift. <laughs> uh, but I am so, like the conviction I have around helping people, because one of the things that really pushed me in the direction, Mike, of saying I'm going to step out on my own was the number of people I talked to that said, I would love to do something different. I just don't know what it is. And there's that, there's the quote by Brene Brown that says, you have to be brave with your life so others can be brave with theirs. And I think that's so true. And I wanted to show people, I wanted to be able to act as a mirror to others of there is another way forward even if it's a slight tweak to what you have been doing. So that is my grounding principle of, and what motivates me to do what I do and work with the people that I work with to help them see they can be an authentic leader and a, the version of themselves that's the best leader possible, but they do have to figure out who they are and who they want to be and not just follow in the footsteps or along the path that someone else puts out for them. Um, I also have this, I'm going to be taking people back to Oaxaca to do experiential retreats because the experience was so profound. As you said, I, I took myself, the whole family, and it wasn't just profound for me, my entire family changed because of it. I mean, we leaned into one another, we are closer, my kids have a better perspective of the world. I mean, we opened their aperture to see what is out there, but we also brought them much closer to the people who lived in that world. And we still have wonderful friends who are there. And if I can give just a little bit of that and help people see who they are authentically to others, um, I mean, like, talk about the donut. That's yeah. the donut that I want to eat now. Right. Right. Time to make the donuts. Yeah, it is time. <laughs> um, I, I, it's an amazing story. It's, it's certainly a very inspirational story, and I'm sure there's a lot more about it in the book. And we, of course, can't you know talk about the whole book because we do want people to buy it. Um, so, but before we uh, before we start pitching the book, I need to ask you some uh, some other questions. Okay. Um, you know, I always like to say that, that this is about the story behind the story, so your story. And, and one way I like to get to know my guest is uh, by talking about pop culture a little bit. So okay. I'm curious, Suzanne, when you were growing up, what were some of your favorite things to watch on TV? Oh, I was like the rerun kid. Um, I think one of my favorite shows to watch was Flipper. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I So I grew up at the beach. I had this idea that, and I had a little rowboat that I had a dolphin, like a play fake dolphin in my imagination that would ride alongside of me in my little rowboat. I I loved it. I absolutely loved Flipper and I liked Leave it to Beaver and I I loved the Muppets. Oh, well, you got, I mean, we can certainly agree on the Muppets because I think it's, that show was brilliant. It was brilliant. And it also, I got so mad at my dad one time because I thought as a child you could go and watch the Muppets. Like I thought you could sit in the audience with the other Muppets and watch the performance. And my dad wouldn't take me 
because he didn't want to tell me that they were just puppets because in my mind, you know, Kermit and Miss Piggy, they were real. Um, but I was, I vividly remember being angry when I said, can we go see the Muppets? And he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have one Muppet you identified with more than the others? Mm, you know, I think my favorite has always been Rolf the dog. A mm. little bit of an old soul, um, a little bit melancholy, but still sees the bright side in life. Right. Kind of tells it like it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean. I was a Fozzie Bear man myself. Okay. Waka waka. You know, the whole waka waka waka. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, you know, maybe it's like the, the, the stand up comedian in me who yeah. bombs uh, more often than not on stage. <laughs> 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 I, I always love Fozzie Bear. Um, what about now? Anything you enjoy watching now? You know, I love the shows that my kids and I can all get into together. We don't watch a ton of TV. Um, but when we can find something that connects all of us, we just recently watched the the new Disney Channel, um, the National Treasure Hunters, which is the first series. And interesting and interestingly enough, it's about a treasure in Mexico. Uh, so we had a little bit of fun watching that one, and it was pretty good. Interesting. Did you? Now this would not be one for the kids, um, or that you would want to watch with your children. <laughs> Because I have three 20-year-olds at home, and I wouldn't want to watch this with them. Um, did you, as a management consultant, ever get into that show on Showtime? I think it was called House of Lies. I did not, no. Oh, with Don Cheadle. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's, you know, it's to management consulting what, like, law and order mm -hmm. is to, you know, police, you know, <laughs> where, 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 where you go in, and in a week, all the problems are solved in whatever company they go into. Yeah. Um, but it is it is interesting. Don Cheadle is, um, I think I have a, a man crush on him. <laughs> not quite sure. I won't tell my wife about that. Um, what about music? What did you like listening to growing up? Um, well, maybe this is the Rolf the Dog coming through. I was also an old soul. Um, I loved James Taylor, Jimmy Buffett. Um, I, I kind of listened to whatever my parents listened to. And then on the down low, I would sneak some Madonna. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I, the, the two Jimmys you uh, just mentioned, well, James Taylor, Jimmy Buffett, two of my favorites as well. I love that singer-songwriter um, vibe. Yeah. But Jimmy Buffett, uh, you know, uh, my family, we see him or we used to see him as often as he would come around. Mm -hmm. um, and I even saw him this past year up in, um, in Woodstock, uh, wherever, oh, awesome. downtown, Bethel, Bethel, New York, um, which was a cool show. And then all, all of a sudden he canceled the rest of his tour because of some health condition. Yeah. But, I mean, the well, man's like 70, 75, 76 now. I know he's, now. he's getting uh, up there, you know. He can't, he can't dance around in bare feet forever, I suppose. I guess not. But whatever he's doing, he's, he still has a young soul to him. Which Absolutely. Is, uh, which is fun. Um in terms of this book now, what big insights into yourself? I mean, I know we kind of been, been talking about them, but any big takeaways, you know, you, you walked away with after writing this book, not just the experience you went through in terms of moving out of Mexico, but the act of writing yeah. and what you learned about yourself during that process? So I think that, that writing the book, I, I call myself like an accidental author because I never intended to write a book. Uh, you know, I know lots of people, it's like a bucket list item. For me, it wasn't. It actually sat, felt really like something that would be so daunting. And I, I found that in myself, breaking it into small chunks, having a, some, a supportive community really helped me see it come into uh, being and, and actually a book start to make sense out of small little snippets of ideas that turned into stories that turned into chapters um, that to me was kind of a big insight in in how much i really appreciated the creative community in addition to the structure that was around it i would also say the another interesting thing when you write a memoir is turning yourself and your family and the people you interact with into characters that have dimension and, you know, on the case of my family, weren't going to piss people off <laughs> too much. Um, so those sorts of things, that was a real interesting process to go through to make sure there was enough substance to the characters and the stories that I was portraying. 
You know, I'm glad you mentioned community because um, I think a lot of people out there who've never written, let's say, a book before, um, think about writing as this very solitary process mm-hmm. where you, know, you kind of go, maybe you go to that cabin in, in Ashford, <laughs> you know, North Carolina, for, uh, for a year, and you don't talk to a soul, and you live like a hermit, and you don't share your work with anybody. But um, most successful authors know that there is a collaborative aspect to it, and there is a community aspect to it that is very helpful when going through the process. And I'm curious if you could talk to, to me a little bit more about the community that you found. Yeah. So I, I got um, introduced to a program called the, Creators Writers, the Creative Writers Institute. Sorry about that. In, it's through Georgetown University. And with that, um, there is a class that I signed up for. And Professor Custer, he, I spoke with him before signing up for the class. And I wasn't even sure if there was a story there. And he said, no, I think there's something. And I think that the community is going to help you draw it out. When I started, I actually thought of maybe writing a book about burnout. And my story would be one of many. And as I started talking with people in the community, there was a class that took place every one night a week. And then there were writer hours afterwards. So you'd have the opportunity to talk about a particular topic about your book with others in the class and then actually go and write. And as I was talking to them, people would say to me, you know, this idea of telling other stories, like your story is compelling. What if you just sat into your story and made it a memoir? And I was like, oh, that sounds scary. But with the encouragement and people consistently saying to me, there's something there. And then being able to bounce ideas off of them and write at different times with people. And sometimes we wouldn't even talk in the writing. You you would just have the Zoom on and we'd all be there quietly on mute doing our writing for two hours. But just knowing other people were there was helpful in that accountability of getting things done. And I probably would have been very much in the camp of solitary, like sit down, type chapter one on the blank piece of paper, and then hopefully something comes of it. Um, And learning that there was a different way to put this together and getting feedback throughout the process was really important to me. And uh, how long did it take you from the time you started your manuscript to the time, um, you know, you were happy with it and you considered it to be finished and ready for publication? Okay, well, I'm going to ask a question as you are already a published author. Are you ever (laughs) happy with it? (laughs) Uh, I'd say happy enough. Okay, 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 good, because I'll go back and now I'll answer that question. Yeah. Um, I think I was happy enough probably, it, it probably took about nine, ten months. To get a, okay. you know, a 45,000 word, so about 200 page manuscript together. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds um, actually pretty fast uh, for a first time um, a first time author. I think my first book, it took me three years to write, <laughs> but I had zero discipline while I was writing it. Well, I will say one of the things, and maybe, you know, I say I'm, I was either like really strategically smart or just I dumb walked into this and I'm going to go with, it's probably the latter. I writing the memoir, I wrote very small vignettes that were about a thousand to 1500 words in the vignette to tell each story. And that actually helped tremendously because sitting down to write a 1500 word piece was pretty easy. And if it flowed, I could get it done in just a matter of, you know, a couple hours. So I always like to end with words of advice that we'd give our younger self. So, Suzanne, I want you to think about that eight-year-old Suzanne working um, as child labor in the hardware <laughs> store who had, you know, who, whose grandfather said, I think you're going places, kid. Um, but if you could whisper some words of advice into her ear, what would you tell the younger Suzanne? Um, I would say you're going places but you've got to stop and look around and see what else is out there because it is not a moving sidewalk at the airport. It is a meandering path through the forest and you're going to have a lot more fun if you take some of those side adventures off of the main path. Yeah. And maybe don't freak out if you can't talk for 24 hours. Um, yeah, yeah. 
you know, <laughs> sink into it. L- learn to learn to enjoy the suck, and eventually something brilliant will happen. Well, Suzanne, where can listeners go to learn more about you? Do you have a website? Do you have any social media handles you want to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So my my website is my business website. It's vominoscoaching.com, and it's vominos with an O, two O's, not the American spelling of vominos. <laughs> um, and to learn more about me, you can go to Suzanne Roski on both Instagram and um LinkedIn and my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and all places you can get books. Any places you can buy books. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for stopping by Uncorking a Story and letting me uncork yours. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.